Today on This Week in Space, we sit down with Jared Head, keeper of the Wooden Space Shuttle in Downey, California. Never heard of a Wooden Space Shuttle? Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 12 for May 20th, 2022, the Wooden Space Shuttle. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Sometimes in order to go green, you've got to get blue. Blue Land, that is. Blue Land was founded on the belief that a cleaner planet starts by reducing waste while creating powerful, effective cleaners for your entire home. Get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com space. And by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV has everything you need to level up your IT skills while you enjoy the journey. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30 at checkout. Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of This Week in Space. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine with my hypergolic co-host, Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief at Space.com. Yo, Tarek, how are you? I'm doing well, Rod. I'm doing well. All systems go for our big talk today. Uh, very exciting. Wow. How about, how about oh, you? That's good. Oh, I'm <laughs> as ducky as ever. And today we are joined by the irrepressible Jared Head, an aerospace engineer who works at the Griffith Observatory, the Columbia Memorial Space Center in Downey, California, and is a weekly host of Tomorrow TV on YouTube. Thanks for joining us, Jared. Yeah, that right there. Glad to be here with all of y'all. And for anybody who hasn't seen it, uh, Tomorrow is a, is a great show. It's on every week, correct? Yeah, every week. We try to do it every Friday that we can at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, oh, my gosh. What is that? That's like right now, like midnight, coordinated universal, something like that. So, yeah, we tend to run on UTC. So that's why I had to do that in my head real quick there. It's like, oh, what time? So, yep, every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. <laughs> Geek alert. Okay, well, so before getting this is to a, know. This is, uh, this is a safe space, Rod. <laughs> we're, all, we're all geeks here. <laughs> Oh, okay, good. Well, then I can let my hair down. <laughs> Besides getting to know more about Jared's many affiliations, we're going to talk about a really interesting story today, the creation of the very first space shuttle, one made entirely out of wood. Yes, this was a full-scale shuttle made of plywood and pine, I would suppose, and after years in dark storage, endless challenges will soon be on display to the public. So we'll learn more about that in a few minutes. But before we indulge Jared, and I do mean indulge, he's a wild man, we have some headlines, but before the headlines, did y'all know it was Tarek's birthday last week? What? No, yes. That's right. That's right. Oh my he's gosh. He's another, he's eroded another year and he's catching up with me fast. So to properly mark this momentous occasion, I decided to commission a little song. Oh so let's no. hear that oh. if we might. Right. And- oh. <laughs> Forty-five trips around the sun and you're just getting started Tariq, you could make the Kessel run in less than twelve parsecs <laughs> Bezos, Branson, Musk be damned, I know that you're the greatest If you raced them all to Mars, they'd be staring at your a- <laughs> I love it you're a big old teddy bear and nobody works harder There's no one on this pale blue dot I'd rather have as my partner So let's pop some bubbly and feel some anti-gravity And talk wormholes, white dwarf string theory over freeze-dried cake you're the Armstrong to my Aldrin, except we actually get along, and here's to you, my <laughs> podcast mate. Tark, I mean Tariq, <laughs> happy birthday. Oh, I got tears in my eyes. That's so sweet. Uh, that's so thank sweet. God thank God that's you. over. We're both <laughs> blushing now. My yeah. favorite partner. So, thank wait, God. Wait, wait, who, who, who's saying that? Who's saying that? Well, like to know. so thanks to the very talented Scott Taylor Schwartz over at Song Glorious, which is at songglorious.com for that rousing rendition. Apparently, it was a uh, Shark Tank winner. 
So they will do <laughs> wow. a little song for you for a commission. And uh, he not only wrote the song, but wrote me a note afterwards saying, uh, hey, got really interested in the podcast. It's fabulous. I love it. I learned all about you guys. I'll be listening every week. So uh, he's part of our new audience. So yeah. well, of the like many, it. many thousands, we now have one more devoted fan. Well, so thank, thank you, Rod. You, Scott, thank you, Scott, for that. Uh, for that I feel incredibly honored to have been here to <laughs> hear that and witness this, this beautiful moment. It's incredible. Kind of makes you all warm and gooey, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So halfway half halfway to ninety. So so on the well, <laughs> I, I I'm two thirds the way there, so I got you beat. All right, so let's get to some headlines. Um, yes. In a very timely one, we just had a press conference with NASA on progress or lack thereof on the SLS. So Tarek, you were covering that. Why don't you uh, get us up to date? Yeah, I literally it just ended as we we logged on to record uh, today's uh, today's podcast, but. I am sorry to disappoint all of the SLS boosters out there um, and, and the people that are watching the rocket because those boosters are pretty cool too. Um, but the space launch system for Artemis 1 will not launch any earlier than August right now, which is substantially later than where either Rod or I had had bet for my Star Trek chair right here. Um, and that's because that's because... Uh, as, as you may recall, they, NASA did try to do a, a wet dress rehearsal where they were going to fuel it up and they were going to do, do a big rehearsal countdown. They could never get it fully fueled. They had a, a, a lot of technical issues. They had a stuck valve. They had a hydrogen leak, which is really bad since that's the fuel. And, uh, and so now it's back in the big VAB barn. They're looking at both of those issues and a lot of other things that, that kind of popped up during the, the walk, uh, the, the, the rehearsal. Uh, and they're looking to go back out to the launch pad no earlier than late May. So that's a Memorial Day rollout, possibly, for a space launch system. Uh, and try this wet dress again sometime in June. Uh, and then if that goes swimmingly and it has to go perfect, then they can try to shoot for August to launch that mission. So uh, it is a new vehicle. Uh, we expected a lot of delays. I'm surprised it did take them this long to say, yeah, you know, May or, or June aren't on the table. Um but uh, but that's a that's another a few months slip uh, for for SLS. So that's that's the latest right now. Um, uh, Bill uh, Bill Nelson, NASA's chief, was actually on Capitol Hill defending the the agency's budget request, and he did say while that's the target, uh, and uh, and while 2025 is the target for the Artemis moon missions landings with the astronauts. Uh, all of those are in flux as long until they can make sure that it's safe to fly. So that's going to be their guiding star. It always has been, uh, and and they're not going to shoot for a date uh, before they shoot for safety. Well, okay. So we both lose but, the bet. That's the important yeah, thing. I don't get the that's chair. That's right. That's no right. That's right. TLDR: happens. my my Star Trek <laughs> chair that I'm sitting in right now is safe here in my office. So uh, Rod's not getting it. Only for now. All right. <laughs> Next story, which uh, also comes courtesy of Space.com, I'm calling Lunar Cops. So apparently Canada is considering legal jurisdiction over crimes committed on the moon and in space, which is kind of a first. We've had some broad guidelines and treaties over that, but I think this is the first specific uh, law that's being proposed. It would cover Canadians that committed or allowed by omission to be committed a, quote, indictable crime in space, so that's lunar surface, lunar gateway in transit, and I suppose low Earth orbit. As the first signatory to the Artemis Accords, Canada appears to be poised to expand their space activities, which is welcome. Uh, this covers all Canadian citizens, not just astronauts, and could become more complex given that people of different nationalities may be involved in the same criminal event. Tarek, you want to add anything to that? Well, this is really interesting because it is very specific to Canada. So it says here that, uh, so this bill, it's called C-19, uh, uh, it's called Bill C-19's Division 18. So the Civil Lunar Gateway Agreement Implementation Act. And it says that Canadians in space can, you know, committing these acts or these omissions to stop them are, uh, would be, would, you know, be considered indictable on Canadian soil. So it's it's just can Canadians right now. It, it seems to me in the reading of this. Now that could be uh, I could be missing missing a beat. 
But I thought that was really specific for 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 a trip to the moon. Uh, so, so we, you know, so they're kind of going to be responsible for all of their crewmates now to make sure that they're they're not uh, committing any of these of these crimes. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, I guess if you're not if you're not on the crew and you're doing something else in space. You know, it's 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 all right. It's when you get to the moon, you got to watch out for this uh, this this new law. You know, I I don't think Canada has a reputation for generating a lot of extremely dangerous astronauts, but I suppose there's always a possibility of a first. I guess we'll uh, keep our eyes on that story. Yeah. Well, we're except gonna... for well, you know, you know, except for Chris Hadfield, uh, guilty of being awesome, right? So there is that. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say something about the guitar <laughs> playing. <laughs> he's actually a pretty good singer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's like I just heard him on the radio that, right? yesterday. Yeah, was he singing? He was. Th- uh, he was talking about going back to space with Sunita Williams on NPR, and they did play uh, his Major Tom rendition uh, from the space station, which is lovely. But they didn't play Tarek's birthday song. So they did how not. Cool can they be all well, right? Thank you again, Scott. Well, we're miss. gonna we're gonna move on to the wooden space shuttle, uh, and we'll be back. With that, in just a moment, after a word from our friends at Blue Land. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away every year? And as if that's not bad enough, each bottle can contain more than 90% water. That's a lose-lose situation for our planet. Plastic has been found in 100% of marine turtles, 59% of whales, 36% of seals, and 40% of seabird species examined. And get this, by 2050, scientists predict that the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. Think about that. That's terrifying. We need to start creating a cleaner planet from home. Now, Blue Land's idea is simple, and it's beautiful. Buy the bottle once, refill it forever. No more plastic waste. The only thing you need to discard is your outdated idea that eco-friendly products are more expensive or less effective. Just fill Blue Land's beautiful Instagramable bottles with warm water, pop in one of the hand soap or spray cleaner tablets, and within minutes, you have powerful cleaning products in the most incredible scents like iris agave, perine lemon, and lavender eucalyptus. From their best-selling clean essentials kit to their hand soap duo and plastic-free laundry and dishwasher tablets, Blue Land has something for every inch of your home. And now, backed by popular demand, is Blue Land's toilet tablet cleaner. Get it before it sells out again. Blue Land's stunning high-quality forever bottles start at just $10 when you buy a kit and are meant to be reused forever with money-saving refill tablets that start at just $2. Try Blue Land today. You'll love it and the planet will thank you. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com space. That's 20% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com space. blueland.com space. All right, so let's talk about the wooden space shuttle. Who knew there was a full-size space shuttle hanging around before the flight test item Enterprise flew the first approach and landing test in 1977? Well, Jared Head knew, at least he knew later. I don't think you were even a glimmer in evolution's eye back in 1997, or 1977. No. <laughs> but it's a great story. I was. I, I was. I was. So, Jared, we're going to ask you to tell us all about this, but first I should probably set it up a little bit. This mock-up has been sitting for decades at the former North American Aviation, then North American Rockwell plant down in California, which was the largest aerospace contractor in Southern California and a major, major factor in the history of the space race. They built the Apollo Command Module. They built the second stage of the Saturn V rocket. They later built all five space shuttles. Was it five or six? All of them. (laughs) Yeah. We could say that's a nebulous yeah, number, we, all of them. <laughs> they later built all the space shuttles at uh, at North American. So this enormous plant was shut down at the end of the 90s, and the company was broken up and sold off to Boeing and a number of other companies. But it remained there for a long time in kind of derelict condition, and only in the past decade or two would these places take down. They were used as years for movie studio stages and so forth. So, Jared, somewhere in all that big expanse, which apparently you, you walked into some pretty spooky situations there with running computers and so forth, was this wooden space shuttle mock-up. So, can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, so they kept the mock-up in the biggest building there called Building One. It was the actual shop floor where things would get built. Uh, and they had cleared out everything. It was uh, like a girderless room. It was over a million square feet in size. It was kind of one of those, like you're standing on one end of the room, you yell, you, there's actual time for your echo to come back to you. It was just massive. Um, in the studio, they actually built a lake in that room, just to give you an idea of how big it is. Uh, and in a corner, just a little corner, you know, it's, it's covered by some Tyvek and a chain link fence around it uh, was this space shuttle just sitting there. Uh, and that was the mock-up that was used by North American Aviation and eventually North American Rockwell to do their design, engineering, and integration work from 1972 to the end of its run there in 1999. Uh, essentially, if you needed to do something with the shuttle, uh, they had a full-scale mock-up there, and you could go see what you needed to change on your part, uh, sort of in the days before you know 3D printing or computer-aided design with things like that. So before we go on, I just you mentioned how big the facility was. So I dug up some quick facts, and I think this is everything in Downey combined at the uh, plant. In the 1960s, at its peak, it employed 35,000 workers, had 2,347,000 square feet of space on 167.8 acres. Um, the amount of electrical wiring was 10 million feet. The miles of plumbing were six miles. They had 5,574 telephones, which doesn't seem like enough for that many employees, if you ask me, and used 87, no, excuse me, 83.7 million gallons of water per year. And the coolest thing of all, I guess, is they had their own mission control, which is something I didn't know. Yeah, which we we found a couple times uh, while we were walking around in there. So <laughs> it's pretty pretty interesting to find those rooms. So well, does well, does their mission control actually look like the one at uh, in Houston? No, uh, their so the one in Houston is obviously sort of everybody's facing in the same direction with that. The mission control that was in Downey, there were sort of aisles, and everybody would be facing in their own independent directions with that. Uh, there was like a sort of set of consoles there, um, but it was mostly desks, and I assume that computers or some sort of systems were on those desks, um, and people would be there monitoring things, looking at things, trying to figure things out, and I guess just make sure the shuttle's doing what it's supposed to be doing during the mission. Jared, you know, we, we were talking about the size of this building uh, that the, the shuttle was in, and I was wondering if you can kind of give our listeners an idea of the size of the mock-up. I mean, I've, I've stood next to these space shuttles, and so they're a lot larger than you think. And just the thought of, of one hidden away inside a cavernous building under basically a giant wrap in a fence is really just shocking to me. And so if you can, can, can you kind of give, uh, give an idea of, of how big this actually is? And then you touched on it a bit, but why would you actually build one uh, of your own you know, while you're designing something uh, that that early on, what would they use it for aside from, you know, going to look at it and be like, oh, yeah, we're going to build a spaceship? Yeah, there's some really great photos of the interior of Building One that show, you know, this is sprawling expanse of a room and then like just this little itty bitty bit on the other side where there's these like white curtains coming down. Um, I guess just to give an idea of how big that room actually is uh, for the movie Jackass 3, at the end of it, they basically drop a huge tank of water on top of a full-sized house and destroy the house with all the guys in it. Um, and that was done in the lake that they have there. And that was even just a small part of, of the room in there. Um, so to fit a full-size space shuttle in there has got to be uh, very, very big because our mock-up, it is one-to-one -one scale. It is the actual size that the space shuttle is. Uh, and to kind of give you an idea, like a rough estimate of how big the space shuttle is, uh, we usually like to say the space shuttle is about the size of a 737. So if you've ever flown on a Boeing 737, that's about how big uh, a space shuttle is. And that's uh, often, as you kind of alluded to there, the first thing that people say to me um, whenever they got to see the mock-up or if I take my friends to go see Endeavor or we will probably hear once we get the mock-up on display in the next couple of years. Usually that first thing we hear is, oh my gosh, I had no idea it was this big because it's big. 
it's a it's a vehicle you know it's it's not small by any measure um of that and uh <laughs> it's just amazing to watch people just kind of like you could see that mind blown kind of roll through their cranium as they realize how big it is um coming in to see it which um also makes it a bit of a technical challenge as to how uh we store it how do we display it and other things like that which i'm sure we'll we'll kind of talk about um a little bit later um but uh, as you talked about earlier with the purpose of the mock-up, um, nowadays when we do engineering, we can do computer-aided design, CAD. Uh, we can also do uh, augmented reality and VR. That's sort of starting to come into play with design. Uh, and in addition to that, we could do, also do rapid prototyping with 3D printing. Um, and, you know, I, oh, I want to make sure this part will actually fit here. I could go print out a plastic piece in like 15 minutes to half an hour, take it, go check it. Yeah, we're good. Um, Back in the 70s, when they were doing this, they weren't doing this on computers. They had a they had a desk with a drafting table, and you would work a, essentially. I guess I would call I would call it a pencil on a very nice mechanical arm that helps make sure you're drawing things very nice, and slide rules to help calculate things. Uh, and uh, actual drawings, um, which very interestingly at the Space Center in Downey, uh, we do have some of the original design drawings for the space shuttle. So we're pretty excited about uh, maybe getting those on display at some point. Um, and uh, you would do these design drawings and they're two dimensional. So you can't really, it's a little difficult to kind of think about uh, that in terms of a vehicle like what does this look like uh so the thing that you would typically do at that time is you would build a mock-up which is a full-scale version of whatever you're designing and in this case because it was a space shuttle um they went ahead and made a full-scale <laughs> life-size space shuttle uh complete with a payload bay uh compl- there were two it had both of its wings at one time uh and it did have a full vertical stabilizer what most people would call a tail on it um and a full mid deck full flight deck as well and in the aft uh there are the full uh, fuel uh, propulsion and hydraulic systems and power uh, and auxiliary power unit systems in there as well along with some uh, along with three of the RS25s or the space shuttle main engines on gimbals in the back of it so um so like you know it, it's for most of us it's going to get as close to the flight hardware as it's actually going to be <laughs> So I guess what what still blows my mind, I, I'm, I'm stuck back in the analog part of this. It's made out of wood, so it's the only space <laughs> shuttle we have to worry about termite incursions, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, wood and plastic laminate, and uh, we got to make sure that termites are not ha- not getting at it. Wood rot as well. Um, that was something mm. that kind of became a little bit of a, a very big, scary, could this possibly be happening? We can kind of touch on that a little bit later if you want to. Um, also, we have to think about like actual layers of fiberglass and adhesive debonding. And um, I don't want to say parts of the space shuttle kind of peeling off of itself. But uh, mm. yeah, there were there were pieces in there that uh, that when we are going to restore it over the next couple of years. We're going to have to do some pretty major work, but nothing that can't be done. So I, we ran a story on this in, in Ad Astra magazine written by the talented Francis French a few years back, and he talked about going into this, and this is when it was in, I think, a different storage place than it is now, but he said it was very dark and spooky and felt more like a, an archaeological expedition then going to look at an artifact of the space age and they had flashlights and hard hats and so forth. And he mentioned um, the fact that it had been part of the, the reason that they had built it was, I mean, obviously for fitting tests and so forth, but also to impress congressmen who were visiting California and they'd bring them in and say, this isn't a drawing here. Here you go. This is a real thing. But you mentioned also this kind of spooky moment where you walked into this facility and saw computers that had been, on for like decades just sitting there idling away yeah um this was this this was done before i was doing the work on the shuttle this was when i was helping out on uh, basically archiving the interiors of these buildings as best we could because it really wasn't known what the owners of the movie studio were going to do at that time uh the the, there was sort of a winding down of the amount of films that were being shot there um but there was no like definitive answer 
as to what the property owners wanted to do. They floated some ideas like, oh, we're going to put like a mixed use mall with a hotel here and other things like that. Um, and now we know that they basically they turned it into a mall. Um, they tore down all the buildings uh, in 2014 and turned it into a mall, which is uh, <laughs> very hilariously right next to another mall that they built after the t tearing down some of the older buildings a decade earlier <laughs> to the north of it. Um, so two malls right next to each other, a, a wall between. <laughs> it's uh, quite entertaining to see that. Um, but uh, there was just, it was just so, like, we couldn't get a definitive, there was no definitive answer as to what they wanted to do and when they wanted to do it. So it was sort of looked at as we got to get inside of these buildings and we got to document every single piece of anything that we can find in here and actually uh, make sure that this is preserved and that, that this is on sort of like a historical archive so that people who are looking back on space race and maybe eventually looking back on the history of humanity uh, can actually have this here and see what was at the time the driving force behind one of the most, I'd say still one of the most technologically advanced machines that we've ever made as a species. Um, and yeah, there was, some, there was some really wild things that we found in there, like the computers that we were talking about. Um, you know, they're still on the, I'm talking like the green CRT kind of computers with the command prompts ready to go. Um, kind of just sitting there waiting for you to put a command in. We did not touch anything because uh, we didn't know the nature of, of what was over there. Um, mostly because when Boeing wrapped up over there, it was their missile division. So that's like something we really don't want to touch. Um, so uh, the last thing we want to do is, is play around with stuff like that. So we kind of left that all alone. Uh, but there still were other things that we found over there, uh, like literal lunches of people that were left there, cups of coffee, <laughs> snacks, uh, coffee uh, machines half full that were still plugged in. Um, not on, but still plugged in. Um, like little refrigerators that I guess they would have for the employees over there. Uh, uh, planning rooms where we would, uh, talking like, 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 30 foot long 10 foot high whiteboards just full of notes and we tried to take pictures as best we could to grab every single note there um i think one of the most mind-blowing ones to me was that we found an area where there was a lot of stuff that was dedicated to the space shuttle and we actually found thermal protection tiles that were inside of bags that had markings that said that they had actually flown on certain missions and um, huh. I'm, I'm not sure what they were doing in downey because to my knowledge the thermal protection work wasn't done uh, in Downey. I don't know if there was some sort of analysis they were doing or something like that. Um, but as far as I know, um, not much, if any, of this stuff that was inside of those buildings made it out before the demolition occurred uh, in 2014. So uh, so our the photos that we have might basically be the only stuff uh, to remember this stuff by. Wow. Jared, how, how, did, how did you get involved in the project itself and become like the warden of the wooden space shuttle and <laughs> as a as a follow-up you also said uh that it at one point had two wings and a, a tail stabilizer and does that mean that it no longer has that right now so yeah the kind of well i guess i'll just start with the the second portion of that question which is uh, it had two wings and it had a full vertical stabilizer and it does not anymore uh it's missing oh, no. the, the the we don't know what happened to the port side wing um or the left side wing and then the vertical stabilizer had the top 20 feet of it chopped off um so that it would actually fit in the dei room um so the dei rooms the design engineering integration room and it ended up being like what you were talking about earlier rob where they had uh, sort of like the PR room where you could come in and do things like that. Um, and it's pretty wild because I remember as a kid uh, at some of the open houses at Boeing, I especially remember the one from Mars Pathfinder when they launched the first you know, rover, a uh, U.S. rover to Mars in 1996. My mom took me over there and I was in that room where the shuttle was at. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, here I am 25 years, 26 years later, uh, that, that, that shuttle is, I guess, my child. Uh, um, if you will, yeah, it's, I'm one of its parents, I guess, is what you would call it at this point. <laughs> one of its legal guardians, um, or you could call me what they called me originally, which was the keeper of the shuttle, um, which is great. And uh, um, in working on that, uh, so we think that they lost the wing. So they lost the wing and the 
the vertical stabilizer to stick it in the DEI room. Um, and uh, that was just a product of the fact that you can only have the roof so high um, in there. Even with that high roof, they still had to chop it off. Um, but uh, kind of in getting involved in it, um, it was mostly from doing that archival work um, where I ended up cross-pollinating that work between the Aerospace Legacy Foundation and the Columbia Memorial Space Center. And uh, I ended up sort of doing some volunteering work at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. Um, and this was right after I had decided to sort of switch my career direction in my life, which is I was originally going to go into filmmaking. I was super stoked about it. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an actor. I know how to act in front of the camera, but I also know how to do all the stuff behind the camera too. That's an advantage apparently. Um, but it wasn't. Um, and I got <laughs> kind of tired of the environment there. So I said, ah, what the heck, I'll just do what I wanted to do when I was a kid and let's go make spaceships. Uh, so went for aerospace engineering other things like that. Uh, and that's what I do now today, uh, in both aerospace engineering and obviously presenting science and space, especially space science and aerospace science to the public, uh, because this is a real, very big uh, PR problem in science and space flight, uh, which is that things are usually not got across very well um, by people. And that ends up sort of costing the ability for people to understand why we do these kinds of things. Uh, so it's sort of like a life's goal to both be a part of what we're doing and also make sure people understand why we're doing it um, and maybe help pr people participate in it by learning about yeah. that as well. Um, yeah. So. Working at the Space Center there, uh, the sort of expertise that I had on the shuttle and the shuttle program kind of came into play. Uh, and then that's where I kind of came on board uh, to work on the mock-up in our first stint of putting it out in front of the public, which that was from 2012 to 2014, um, which was uh, a, a really great uh, year that I got to work on it from 2012 to 2013 before I left and then eventually returned after they said, hey, we're move making some progress on it. You would you like to come back and be a part of that? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So came back in 2017 and now we are actually making progress on it, uh, which is very exciting. And uh, yeah, just uh, the, the period of 2012 to 20, uh, 2011 to 2013 when I worked on it was really amazing. Uh, there's some really cool things that happened during it. So it's worth mentioning the Columbia Memorial Space Center is is intended as a testament to the work of North American Aviation and Downey. Uh, the director is a gentleman named Ben Dickow, I hope I got his name right, yep. who's uh, campaigned very hard to make that facility everything it is and to indeed to expand it, which we should talk about as well. But I remember when they were getting ready to tear down the remainder of the buildings, there was quite a scramble. And I think uh, Jerry Blackburn, who's part of the support group for you guys uh, I think leads it as a matter of fact I think uh, yeah. was quite active in that and th the call went out for people to come help save documentation and artifacts was there much preserved and will any of it be displayed with the shuttle when it's uh, put into its permanent display so from my understanding uh, mostly because that was done independent of the Columbia Memorial Space Center that was done by the Aerospace Legacy Foundation, which uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Blackburn, really great archivist and, and champion for the history of Downey. Uh, he's, he runs that. Um, and we adore having him because he just tells us all the co all such cool things about uh, what happened over in the facility. And I really hope we get to preserve those stories, uh, not just from him, but everybody that wants to talk about it. Um, that's, that's one of our big goals. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we are working Working very hard to archive as much as we can, um, and from what I understand, we're still archiving things that were pulled out uh, from that that day where it was, hey, everybody kind of got to go get everything um, <laughs> with that there. Uh, and I mean, we're still almost eight years after that. So uh, yeah, it's there was a lot that was pulled out and we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, the plan is that we're going to try to put as much as we can um, on display once we get our new new building built next door to the current building for the Columbia Memorial Space Center. Uh, and Eventually, uh, we are hoping to put every single document that we have online uh, that you could go to a digital archive from the comfort of your house and look at it there uh, and kind of go through whatever you need to go through. So um, we're trying to make sure that not only are we like a place that 
that archivists uh, can go to. We also make sure people who are just interested can kind of come in and look over the documentation that we've been able to save over the years. Well, that, that was my next question, Jared, is, is kind of what's next. So you're, you're in this process of, of, you know, gearing up for restoration and whatnot. I've, I've seen the, the other shuttles that, you know, that, that have been on display. So we've got, uh, uh, Endeavor in, in Los Angeles at the California Science Center, um, Discovery at the Smithsonian, Atlantis at KSC uh, in New York, where Space.com is based. We have the Enterprise, which is always always a thrill. Um, and then there's a few others, right? Uh, other mock-ups, there's the Pathfinder. Um, there's a different in, inspiration that I was reading about earlier, and we should probably talk about the name. But Definitely. Uh, how... <laughs> how, how uh, uh, how, how, what is there a vision right now about how you want to display this so that the public can see it and get that, that sense of scale um, at, the, at the center uh, or, or wherever you want to display it? And, and then what, it, what is the, the, the goal there? For, will it be the centerpiece then with all of the, the, the archive uh, items around it? Is it going to be outside uh, or, or is that all still in flux right now? Uh, right now we have a built. So right now we have two for sure things. Uh, we have the design of the building. So we have that. It's going to be amazing. I love it. It's very organic, uh, but still very aerospacey. Um, so I was really glad that they were able to keep that. I've, there's just something about that aerospace aesthetic of like hangers and things like that that just really like speaks volumes to having the actual stuff there. Um, with it. Uh, so we've got the building. We know that for sure. We know what it looks like. Uh, we have a rough floor plan of it. So basically building stuff, uh, shape, look, interior, we have a very solid idea as to what it is. And we also know the shuttle is going right in the middle of that. And we are not going to hide the shuttle in any way that we can. We're going to make sure that the shuttle is as open as possible uh, so that you can actually see the mock-up. Um, we're also going to have uh, the side of the building that is facing the road uh, that allows you to access the Space Center, um, we're going to have that all glass. So that way, even if you're not visiting the inside of the building, even if we're closed or something like that, you can actually still see in and see the shuttle uh, sitting there. We think that uh, one of our biggest things that we really are focusing on is making sure that we have uh, a space that is inviting for everyone. We do not care what your background is. We don't care where you're coming from, who you are, what you're doing. We just want you to come in and feel like you're very welcome to explore and learn and understand about uh, about the aerospace history of Downey and about this amazing artifact from the space age that we have in front of you uh, to take a look at. Um, there are some things I could talk about that are going to happen a little bit down the line, um, but you know, there's, there's, yeah, I might be able to talk about them whenever you want me to on this, on the program today. <laughs> well, well, before uh, we let go me, let there. Me, I was going to say, let me ask you this. NASA never let me touch a space shuttle ever before <laughs> they retired them. So will I be able to touch this space shuttle or go inside? And, and is that part of the design? Yes. That is the oh. plan. Uh, we we ha the plan is to allow you to go into the payload bay, into the mid deck, and into the flight deck. Uh, nice. How we do that in terms of getting you into the mid deck <laughs> and the flight deck, <laughs> we're working on that uh, because. Yeah. Um, uh, so one of the things that I did on the shuttle during my original stint working on it from 2011 to 2013 um, was basically making sure that it was safe and that we documented anything that was occurring inside, any changes, any warping of wood or changes of plastic or things like that. Uh, so about once a month, we would go inside of the shuttle uh, and go everywhere that we safely could um and i can tell you that the inside of a space shuttle is not made for sitting on the ground in 1g it's made for being either in the vertical on the pad or in weightlessness where you could float around the the, the crew cabin um so we've got to figure out how to take an interior that is not at all designed to be sitting on the ground in 1g and make it so that you can actually sit on the ground in 1g um yeah. so we're, we're trying to figure out at the moment as to how we want you to access the shuttle because it does have a crew hatch, like an actual full crew hatch, uh, complete with a window and handles, locking mechanisms and everything, like if it's there. Um, 
and we're trying to figure out if we want you to go through the crew hatch to get in uh, to the mid deck or if we want you to go through the airlock because there is an airlock um, on our shuttle as well. It's sort of one of the original style airlocks where it's inside of the mid deck, not outside in the payload bay like the later designs were when they when they did the servicing of the shuttles and they moved them out to get some more room in the mid deck. Um, it's, it's OG, it's very tight, uh, it's very cramped and uh, I find it amazing that they would put seven people in there for up to two weeks at a time uh i uh, it's hard enough being in there for an hour with three other people documenting things so um so it's gonna be very interesting when we do that uh, there's also like a little opening as well in the side of the payload bay that uh, was uh, that people were able to step inside of so we might we might go that route and then have you go through the airlock to come in um and uh yeah we'll have to see about that there's there's some things about the airlock that will make it very difficult i mean really I should rewind on that sentence and say there's there are uh, everything about the interior of it is difficult and we're going to have to figure <laughs> out. Uh, but the goal, the absolute goal is that, yes, you are going to go be able to go inside of this, uh, see what the interior of a shuttle would have been like. Um, we don't know whether we're going to make it like an original cockpit or the glass cockpit of later i would prefer to keep it the original cockpit just because of the historical references that are inside of there all of the systems that are the uh, the mock-up of the systems that are in there are for the original cockpit not for the glass cockpit um so it would be really great to keep that but also at the same time we gotta we gotta kind of figure out how we want to display that so Tarek, you brought up being allowed to touch space shuttles uh and because your publication sends you to a lot cooler things than my publication seems to, including a zero G flight that I'm never going to forgive you for. Um, I, I just want to relate a short story in the mid nineties, late nineties, I guess I was uh, snoozing at home one night and the phone rang at one in the morning. I picked it up and it was a friend of mine that worked on the shuttle turnaround crew out in, uh, Palmdale Lancaster area. And uh, he had been called up to Edwards because they had had a landing there. They had to, to land out at Edwards instead of the shuttle landing facility because of weather, as I recall. I hadn't given it much thought. So the phone rang and I picked it up and he told me who it was. And I said, what's up? And right as I said, what's up? I realized what was up. And he said, uh, <laughs> you need to drive up right now. And I said, oh, what? Oh, oh. So I got my butt in my car and drove up there at about 95 miles an hour. Next thing I knew, I was in a bunny suit, and I was sitting in the commander's seat in Discovery for about an hour while they were <laughs> working on various things in the dark. And uh, and this includes, like, walking past guys with M16 at the gate and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and the guy's telling me, he said, you know, they don't even let the astronauts' wives in here, right? And I said, yes, sir. But um, <laughs> as yeah, amazing as it I'm was to sit in... Them, so. As, as amazing as it was to sit inside, they had uh, one of the access panels off that showed the um, the piping that goes from the connect with the external tank to the three main engines. And as you said earlier, you just don't get a sense of the scale of these things by looking at pictures. So as amazing as seeing a shuttle is because they're so large, seeing those pipes in there that had to be 20, 25 inches in diameter, they're immense. It just really brought home the scale of how much was going on, how much fuel was flowing, how much force was being oh. exerted by those three engines. And it's just, it's jaw dropping, you know, and it, it was a really magical moment that you didn't have. So there, um, before we go to our break, I just want to ask Jared, you, you've got a, uh, an Apollo 12 boilerplate test item out uh, of the command module out in front of the museum now. Yep. Is there any other Apollo paraphernalia that's going to be shown when you get your new exhibit up? Absolutely, yeah. So we have we have Apollo boilerplate twelve outside. The public can visit that anytime that they want to. That's free. Uh, there's no charge for it. It's just outside. Uh, that we always like to point out that is the first Apollo command module that flew because it was used for an abort test um, in the uh, pre-transonic range, so just after uh, flight. So we like to say that is the first one that flew on a rocket because. It was. Uh, and we also have boilerplate 19, which was used for radio frequency testing. And they chucked it out the back of a cargo plane to test the parachutes as well with it. Uh, uh, boilerplate 19, just like our shuttle, is currently in storage. Uh, we do plan to 
bring it back out uh, and display it. Uh, during our, the first stint that we had our shuttle on display, we did have uh, boilerplate 19 in the building with it, and we talked about it there as well when we brought the public in. Um, but uh, yeah, we're gonna put we're gonna put it there, uh, and we really want a real command module, an actual flown command module, not a uh, test module. Like we want one that was actually crewed, uh, because we built it, so it should kind of come home. I mean, that's kind of our attitude about it, which is that uh, uh, they're actually all ours. So if you don't mind returning <laughs> them, uh, we'll we'll be very happy about that. You forgot to stamp it, return to sender. Uh, so stand by one as we take a moment to visit with our Space Age partner, IT Pro TV. This episode of This Week of Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. It's important when looking for an online IT training platform, that you're getting the most up-to-date content and certifications. So let me make it easy for you. Just go to IT Pro TV. In fact, they just released a new course, CompTIA A Plus Core 1 and Core 2 series. This course is designed for professionals who support today's core technologies from security to networking to virtualization and more. CompTIA's a certification is an industry standard for launching IT careers in today's digital world. In this course, you'll learn about hardware, operating systems, networking, security, and troubleshooting. We talk about how great IT Pro TV is, but here's a reminder why. They have seven studios where they film Monday through Friday. Their courses go from the studio to their course library in 24 hours and are divided into 20 to 30 minute segments for easy binging. They make sure you're prepared for your exams with their virtual labs and practice tests. The best part about IT Pro TV is that you can learn to get certified on your own schedule and it's always entertaining. May is ramping up for summer and so is IT Pro TV. They're focusing on Azure and have two free webinars this month for you to check out now available on demand. What is Azure Bicep with Adam Gordon and Wes Bryan and All Things Cybersecurity with Daniel Lowry and John Hammond. Don't forget about your IT team. Check out an IT Pro TV business plan for your team today. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use code twit30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. So let's talk a little bit, if we could just shift gears here for a second, about your work up at Griffith Observatory, which is a, uh, an experience I share. I worked up there for about 10 years when I was a whole whole lot younger than I am now, and way before you did. Um, yes. What do you do up there, and what's that been like? Because the, there's been a real transformational period happening there. Yeah, a little bit. And uh, I guess I guess I should have like prefaced this entire thing by starting off by saying that my views and opinions are mine, mine alone, and better than yours. Um, so uh, fair enough. <laughs> so obviously, I'm not reflecting any of my employers. These are just me. Uh, but uh, yeah, up at Griffith, uh, I started working up there in 2013, um, uh, and. Uh, it just kind of wasn't compatible for me to stay at Columbia. I also wasn't happy. I think I could publicly say I wasn't happy with the way things were going with the mock-up. It seemed like uh, everybody who was working on it was jumping ship. And I just stayed on as long as I could to try to do as much as I could. But it just became a point where it was just me doing it. Um, so kind of had to just kind of step away from it. Glad I was able to come back and now we're making it happen. Um, but at that time, I decided to stick with Griffith. Uh, I work as a museum guide up there, which I don't think is a very good way to describe what we actually, at least someone like me actually does. Um, Cause I often work uh, back at house with curatorial staff. Um, they are some amazing people, but they're not exactly the best at understanding aerospace, which is great uh, because I'm not the best at understanding astronomy or cosmology or astrophysics. So they, they lay it on me too, just like I lay it on them with aerospace. Um, and it's a pretty amazing group of people uh, in just how much we all collectively know and how much we all collectively share with each other uh, up there. And I help produce some of the shows that you see up there, like All Space Considered, um, which is our monthly show that we do currently online, hopefully in person sometime again, uh, which is free for everybody to come and watch. Uh, and we'll talk to some amazing people. I think maybe one of my favorite guests we ever had was uh, Dr. Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission that did the flyby of Pluto in 2015. Um, 
And in fact, uh, yep, there's there it is right there. And the, there's my boss in the top left right there, Dr. David Reitzel, a fantastic astrophysicist uh, and uh, just a really fun crew uh, to work with. Uh, we're just a bunch of people who really like learning about things and then figuring out a way to tell people who may not think about these things all the time or uh, who who may not have taken uh, the the uh, the six deadly levels of calculus uh, to get through, uh, you know. So because uh, uh, this stuff is really difficult to, I, I don't want to necessarily say translate, but put into a language that people who aren't scientists can understand. And uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, science is not very good at doing its own public relations. Um, it's very narrow. It's very ivory tower. Uh, it's very, very much, uh, you know, what are you plebs doing here kind of attitude um, at times. So we try to make sure that we can uh, be a place that that is the polar opposite of that. And I'm really glad that we're as successful at that as we are. I was so I was so into to Jared's description there, and I was reflecting about my own experiences at Griffith when I was living in Los Angeles. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful place there. Jared, you know, uh, I, I know that you also build your own rockets too, and yes. so I did want to ask, uh, like, do you do you bring them to Griffith and launch them from there? You know, or <laughs> or do you have to go out? What kind? Of, I mean, I launch Estes rockets, and I and they still auger in from time to time. So I imagine the ones I've seen for you are a bit larger uh, there. So I wanted to ask you. Yeah, but you have to remember everything in California burns, so can't do <laughs> yes. that at Griffith because it's surrounded by flammable fuels. Yeah. Uh, so, so the kind of rockets that you guys are playing around with, it sounds like you guys are playing around with sport rockets, which are excellent. Good way to start. It's definitely a good way to say, <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. It's a great he's way putting to us start. down. He's just being nice about it. No, Your little toy no. rockets. No, I'm not. I'm look, they are toys, but at the same time, they're really good toys. It's like that. It's like buying a, a, a $80 telescope. You know, you want to make sure that you buy that first. <laughs> okay. Look, I'm working with you here. I'm trying to work with you here to make it. Okay, happen. okay. <laughs> it's like buying that eighty dollar telescope before you move on to buy your your next level Losers. telescope. Loser. Um, Loser. You want to make sh you want to make sure that you enjoy doing something before you pour money into it. Um, there you so go. Okay, that's good. I mean, any any hobby that you want to take seriously, you should dabble in it first before you decide. So what to you're saying is, before we starve our children or spend their future college tuitions on our big liquid fueled rockets, we should use our toys first. Yeah, definitely. It's a good way okay. to do it. Um, and then when you're ready to start blowing that money, move to high power rocketry, which is what I do, which is sort of the bigger stuff. Um, and no, we're really not allowed to <laughs> launch them wherever we want <laughs> um, because they are regulated by the FAA and other things uh, and other agencies of the United States government. Um, so there are very select areas that we have to do them at. Here in Southern California, uh, we go out to Lucerne Dry Lake, which is a area uh, east of Apple Valley in the desert. If you're from Southern California, you're probably saying there's places east of Apple Valley. Yes, uh, <laughs> there are. Uh, and it's, it, it is, as its name implies, a dry lake. It's about five miles long north, three miles long uh, east and west. Um, and we launch from there because it's a pretty safe place to do it. If something goes wrong with the rocket, we're not going to careen out of the urban park into a neighborhood. Uh, it'll careen out of control away from wherever we're at hopefully, and uh, go over the lake bed and do whatever it's going to do if something goes wrong. Um, so it's just a, obviously a much safer place because these are rockets where we are starting to get to the point where uh, I would say some of the people that are doing this, the only thing that separates them uh, from a, from launching a NASA sounding rocket uh, is that they're not doing it for NASA <laughs> uh, with that. So I've seen I've seen some pretty potent ones, you know, te, you know, like the ten thousand pounds of thrust uh, firing off and just wow. like ridiculous levels. I am nowhere near that, <laughs> uh, right, but I do have the entry level certification. There's two groups: the National Association of Rocketry and Tripoli Rocketry Association. Um, NAR is a bit more like like regular people like me, uh, Tripoli is a bit more like people who want to actually build a liquid engine in their garage. Um, so, uh, but they both overlap. They both 
recognize each other and work with each other and do certifications. So uh, I guess it's just like the regulars and the nerds, but we're all cool with each other. Um, <laughs> and I've got a level one certification. There's three levels you can go and, and level one is basically build a rocket, fly it successfully and be able to answer the questions that the people at the safety table will pose to you. Um, and let me tell you, they are going to, they will pose those questions that you've never thought of to you um, because uh, as, as was explained to me, um, the, the certification process in rocketry is to weed out the idiots um, because it's a hobby that we, the margins are so thin that there is no room for incompetence. Um, and yeah, we, we just don't want that in that kind of a hobby. <laughs> well, it's been a real honor geeking out with you guys today. I'd love to continue this conversation sometime. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming on. Jared, where can we go to find out more about you and your spacely activities? Definitely. So, oh boy, I got to go down the rundown uh, with this here. So uh, for tomorrow, you could go to youtube.com slash T-M-R-O. Like we said at the start of the show, uh, we do the those shows. Uh, we try to do them every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, uh, regardless of whether it's standard or daylight, we do it at 5 p.m. Uh, so just take that into consideration. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you can jump on my own YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jared Head. That's J-A-R-E-D-H-E-A-D, where I do that at jaredhead.com. And in addition, if you tweet, I tweet too much. Uh, and I talk about space, uh, what it's like to work with the public. Uh, and of course, our mock-up too, which you may get some sneak peek stuff there. Uh, and that's just at my name, J-A-R-E-D-H-E-A-D. And I hope to see you on all of them soon. Tark, I know you've had a busy space week, so thanks for making time for us today. And where can we find out more about the amazing Tark Malik? Well, as always, uh, Rod, it's it's a, it's a pleasure to bring all the daily space news that's fit to print at space.com. Uh, but I'm also on the, twi the Twitter at Tark J. Malik, looking for all the, the fun space things. And you might find me in my basement building my brand new Lego Millennium Falcon that I got for <gasps> Star Wars Day. And I'm yes. very excited about it. So what, what, did we get the big one? No, the little one, the little one, but it's hey, still good. It's, it's it's enough. It's enough. Okay, you guys got to get off this whole size comparison thing. You're making me feel very old here. Uh, as for me, you can see my magazine, Ad Astra, at adastramagazine.com, and my website is pilebooks.com. And if I may just puff for a moment, in a few months, I'll be reappearing on William Shatner's Unexplained on the History Channel, which I recorded yesterday. I'll be sure to preen about that in a few months when it comes on the air. We were talking about ETs and first contact. So that was a fun afternoon. So thanks, everybody, for joining us for another episode of This Week in Space. As always, feel free to send us feedback at TWIS at twit.tv. That's TWIS at twit.tv. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe. Give us a review, if you will, and tell your friends because we all need more friends. And you can always head over to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. See you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.